began their, their migration to California, 1,700 miles. Um, the family remembers that Thomas and, and Alma, the, the younger daughter, would take off in the morning with the oxen because they only traveled about two and a half or three miles an hour. Mom and the baby would stay behind, <clears throat> stay behind and break camp and then they'd take off. About lunchtime, the mules would catch up with the oxen. They'd eat lunch and then uh, both continue on. Uh, Edna would, would get to the day's camp uh, first. She'd set things up and then before nightfall, Thomas would come in with the oxen. Um, the family came to California and frankly, it's still unclear whether they used the Oregon Trail and came down into Northern California through Alturas, or whether they actually crossed one, one of the uh, uh, passes up here in the Sierra. And the fact that, that Monty Wolf had such an affinity for this area leads me to believe at least that there's a possibility that they may have come over this way into California as opposed to over the north. But regardless, the, uh, the family settled in Corning, California, uh, which is uh, kind of between Red Bluff and uh, uh, Redding, up in Northern California, but in the, the Central Valley. And they were olive farmers. So they, this was their first uh, 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 exodus from, from wheat. Um, it's very sad that I can't show you this picture. Um, because, and you can't, I know, it's just a little blob to your eyes, but this is a picture that the Wrights lived in when they were in Corning, California in 1905, and the photo was taken by Archie. And uh, as you can see, I know you can see that it's very burnt out. It was because Archie probably didn't know that aiming the camera into the sun would, would uh, wipe out the photo. Okay. I need to warn you all, I'm going to jump through time here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try and keep this in a contiguous fashion um, through his entire life, but a portion of Archie's life, and that's the years between 1906 and 19, uh, about 1918, I'm going to do flashbacks to those years as we go through this. So please bear with me when I say we're moving from this year, now we're flashing back to this year. It, it'll make sense later. So the, summer of the summers of 1916 through 1920, um, a cattleman named Dave Ellingham, or Ellingham, excuse me, um, he remembered a, a man named Monty Wolf in 1916 working for Charles Tryon, who some of you may know or remember. There may even be Tryons here. I don't know. Are there any Tryons here? Dang. Okay, well, um, Monty Wolf was a, a cowboy during those years, and, you know, his, his job was basically I had same job that uh, the, I saw the cattle across the road over there. There are, there are people working those cattle, and that's what he did. Uh, back in 1916 um, near Highland Lakes, which is where uh, Tryon had his range. Um, another interesting uh, item where, where Monty Wolf touched the historic record was uh, in 1918, he registered for the draft, uh, which was the third World War I draft. Uh, and, and it was basically for the geezers. You know, they had, they had gotten all the young'uns in the first two, and now they were going after the older people in the third draft. Monty Wolf, um, here in Alpine County, uh, went down and, and uh, filled out his draft card and um, indicated that Charles Tryon was his boss in Alpine, California, is, was the term he used. And, uh, uh, he also mentioned that he lived in the town of Tuolumne, which was uh, kind of a new one for me. So 
During that same period of time, I mentioned summers, 1916 to 1920, he's up in the mountains in Alpine County, he's a cowboy. Um, in the winters, uh, during the same period, 1916 to 1920, um, he did what a, what a lot of people did who worked in the mountains. He went down below the snow line and um, uh, spent his time uh, in Tuolumne County, um, which, you know, is sort of across the highway and down a little bit. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that the part of Tuolumne County he was in was not the Sonora side, which is really easy to get to, but it was the side of Tuolumne County on the south side of the Tuolumne River, which uh, if any of you have ever driven to, uh, to uh, uh, like Yosemite, um, it's, a, it's kind of a, an odd place that's very difficult to get to. Um, at the time, he was still using the name Archie Wright when he was when he was down in Groveland, he used the name Monty Wolf when he was up in the mountains. This was a, a very common thing for this man. He had a different name for every community that he lived in, and, and he, he never broke the rule of being this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. He was very careful about that. Um, One of the first uh, uh, items that uh, uh, brought Monty Wolf, or, or well, we'll say Monty Wolf for in, in this case, um, to notoriety was in Christmas, or on Christmas in the year 1920, uh, Monty Wolf entered the cabin. He, we all know Aunt Monty entered cabins on occasion. He entered the cabin of, of uh, uh, Robert Antonini down outside of Groveland and when he was in the cabin he took his his fishing license and Art Chimke if you're here this is proof that Monty bought a fishing license um, he he uh, uh, dropped his fishing license in this man's house and took his fishing license and left and the guy comes back a week later and he opens up his trunk where he keeps his fishing license and there's Monty Wolf's fishing license sitting in his, in his cabin. So, you know, he didn't think anything of it. It was like, you know, that darn Monty Wolf. And uh, um, three days later, his cabin was broken into again and the two fishing licenses were switched back. And... Uh, <laughs> That, that made the local press, and uh, because it made the local press, I was able to tell you about it today. Um, one thing that I need to tell you is that my research has all been based on places where Monty Wolf or Archie Wright touched the public record. So everything, everything that I'm telling you is backed by either newspaper articles, and there were hundreds of them, um, or censuses, um, I've worked with the National Archives, I've worked with the archives of Calaveras, Alpine, Amador, and Tuolumne counties, as well as the two valley counties of Stanislaus and um, San Joaquin um, in this research. And what I did is I, every time I, I was able to pluck a truism from the public record, I put it into a Monty Wolf timeline that was also associated back to a map. So I had a, a date, a place where he was, and a thing that he did. And I did that for, for quite a number of months until there weren't really very many spaces to fill in anymore. And the picture of what this guy, what this guy did during his life started to become, started to become very clear. Um, the, the thing that made newspapers as far away as San Francisco take notice uh, was an event in 1921 that some of you Money Wolf fanatics may have heard about. Um, I really wish you could see this. This is a uh, newspaper clipping from the Oakland Tribune, and I picked that one because it's pretty far away. And it's uh, the, the uh, title of, or the headline reads, Bandit Who Held Up Constable 
is at bay in canyon. Man escapes after foiling pair who try to arrest him. He is armed and dangerous. Well, the story was that a, a farmer who lived down in the um, Groveland area, God, I wish I had my slides. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, he had uh, uh, one, of his, one of his empty cabins on his, on his range land broken into and had some items stolen from the cabin. And he was convinced that a man named Ed McGrath had taken them. Now, I mentioned that Monty used a different, different names in different places. In, in the southern Tuolumne area, he used the name Ed McGrath. And um, there was, a, in those days, they didn't have a sheriff working that part of the uh, county. They had constables. You know, each little community had a constable. And um, Constable Billy Schmidt, whose name will go down in infamy, um, took Miss, the farmer, Mr. Hadley, out to where they thought Ed McGrath was. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with that part of the county, but the, the uh, Tuolumne River is in a really, really deep gorge that's probably two miles across and about 2,000 feet deep. And it really is a barrier for people that want to cross. Um, what happened was uh, they found Monty Wolf where they expected to find him um, on a piece of property. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Pine Mountain Lake, uh, where everybody from the valley and the Bay Area moves up to live in the Sierras. Well, Pine Mountain Lake is fed by a little creek called Big Creek. And Big Creek comes out of Pine Mountain Lake, go, enters a, a, a deep gorge, and dumps into the Tuolumne River. And Ed McGrath was working a placer claim um, in that area. And when uh, uh, Constable Schmidt and uh, Farmer Hadley walked up upon him, they scared the hell out of him, first of all. And uh, they explained to him why they were there. And Monty um, agreed that, that he would uh, leave with them. And he asked if he could uh, go, go into his tent and get out of his boots and put on a pair of shoes for the trip. So Monty enters his tent, and he steps out one second later with a, um, a Winchester aimed right at the officer and the witness. And he said, my name's not Ed McGrath. I'm Monty Wolf. And the newspapers caught on, and the foiled arresting officers and escaped. What Monty did is he, uh, he, he chased them up the trail a little ways to make sure they were leaving, ran down to his camp, packed up the things he could carry, because he knew a posse would be coming after him the next day, and, um, and he hit the trail. And he, what he did is he followed the Tuolumne River down to... Um, I'm not going to remember the name of this place. Uh, um, it's not there, and I'm. It's it's uh, one of the ferry crossings across the uh, Tuolumne Ward's Ferry. Um, so he 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 uh, went down to Ward's Ferry, crossed the Tuolumne there, and then went to. Um, for those of you that are historians, there was a family named the Burgers, and they, they actually operated the, the um, when it was still running, the ferry across that part of the Tuolumne. He stopped there, asked for a pack of matches, had a uh, rifle in one hand, shotgun in the other, they gave him the matches, and he took off. And uh, that was the last time that he was seen. Um, the, Tuolumne, or the Southern Tuolumne Law Enforcement Agencies set up a, a line across the south part of the Tuolumne, and Sheriff uh, uh, William Sweeney, he was, he was for many years the sheriff of uh, Tuolumne County um, in Sonora. He set up a line to block Monty Wolf on the other And uh, that was the last time that he was seen. Um, the Tuolumne 
our, the Southern Tuolumne Law Enforcement Agencies set up a, a line across the south part of the Tuolumne, and Sheriff uh, uh, William Sweeney, he was, he was for many years the sheriff of uh, Tuolumne County um, in Sonora, he set up a line to block Monty Wolf on the other side of the river. And their plan was to cut him off before he made it into the mountains. And uh, as the newspaper articles, which I was going to show you up here, each one of them, as the newspaper articles uh, described, he, he, um, he was able to hide his trail to such a degree that the hounds that were coming after him couldn't find him. And what Monty Wolf did that year is he traveled up the Clavey River, which uh, is, is in Tuolumne County. It's the first river south of the Tuolumne River. So it's, it's actually a tributary of the Tuolumne, but it's a, a little bit further south into the county. He, um, he made it up into the mountains. They, they realized that they had lost him, and they set up a line at the snow line and uh, as the newspapers described it, um, no man can survive in the mountains alone uh, during the winter and that we're going to keep this line in place because he's going to come running out and we're going to nab him. And he never saw him again. But what Monty did is he traveled about 20 miles upstream in the snow and he went to a place called Bell's Meadow or Bell Meadow which you may have heard of. Um, there was a, a, a cattle range cabin there. He spent the whole winter in that cabin. He, uh, the cabin had some food, he ate it all. He also uh, shot several deers and probably ate venison while he was there. The reason I mentioned the deers is because he left a large pile of deer hides there. And um, this was a, for Monty Wolf, uh, leaving skins or, or hides behind was a kind of a calling card to say Monty Wolf has been here. And he also placed value on those. Um, when the newspapers covered the article, they, they made it read like he came in here and he left a bunch of skins. We don't know why, but he, was, he was making a statement. Well, that year, 1921, a man named Archie Wright entered the wilderness, and a man named Monty Wolf came out. Archie Wright was never seen or heard from again, and Monty Wolf never, ever used that name. Or if he did, he, he shared it in confidence with somebody who took it to their grave. Um, so, I just did about six months. <laughs> um, <laughs> Meanwhile, up in the Palo uh, in the Palouse, uh, the Palouse, uh, for those of you that don't know, is um, a large wheat growing region that sits on the border of western Washington and eastern, uh, excuse me, eastern Washington and western Idaho. And if you look at the satellite photos of the Palouse, it's sort of like the uh, Central Valley. It's a big green spot that you can see from space. Well, um, Archie's family uh, had learned that there were opportunities for homestead up in the Palouse. They were still living in Corning. They decided that they were going to go for the Palouse. So again, they loaded up the wagons and, uh, and the kids, sold off what belongings they couldn't carry, and um, traveled from Corning, California, up to the Palouse in eastern Washington, where, um, where Thomas was able to uh, purchase land based on a law, the law of 1820, I believe, which um, stated that if, uh, if there's a public land auction and land doesn't sell in the auction, it can be sold for, <clears throat> for a buck and a half an acre. So Thomas's father, this man who had lived in 10 places um, during his life, ch chasing the, the golden opportunity of a, you know, large profits growing wheat, um, 
they, they left for the Palouse and, um, and lived up there for the rest of their lives. Um, however, Archie Wright decided to stay in California. I mean, we all know that. Now, <clears throat> Monty Wolf uh, is still invisible here in California. He's still um, a, you know, a, a bandit running from the law. In 1923, after he had wintered in, um, in Bell's Meadows, uh, he, he, uh, there were a couple of reports that he had been seen in the Cow Creek area, which is over by the Dardanelles um, on the Sonora Pass. And the, uh, the law officials respond to that, responded to that by saying that Bonnie Wolf is dead. He, there's no way he could have survived. Um, we don't believe that the sightings in Cow Creek were really Monty Wolf. Well, <clears throat> what happened, and, and I'm not sure how he found out, but in 1922, while this poor guy is toughing it out in this, in this snow-covered cabin in Bell's Meadow, uh, his father, Thomas, passes away up in the Palouse. And somehow he gets word, uh, and while everybody is looking for him down here and waiting for him to come out of the mountains, he, in the meantime, had traveled up to the Palouse and spent about a year and a half up there with his, uh, with his mother and his sister and brother um, after father had died. Um, excuse the... Lay here. Meanwhile, in Sonora, oh, there's another piece I need to tell you. Uh, Monty Wolf, the the um, the bandit, um, was uh, that was the uh, Modesto newspaper stated that that Monty Wolf is laying low because there's a sheriff's election coming up in Tuolumne County, and he was. He, he was convinced that the sheriff would try to arrest him uh, in, in order to win the election. Um, and, and that made all the papers, and that people were sure that, you know, that's what Monty Wolf was doing. Actually, he was visiting his mom. Um, he, uh, he left uh, the Palouse that year and never saw his family again, so that was the last time that that uh, Archie saw his family. In uh, the summer of 1925, Monty Wolf shows, shows up back down here in California. And um, he uh, uh, lives somewhere in Tuolumne City. And when he got back down here from Washington, he went up into Sonora and approached the, the uh, American Legion and said, I'm a World War I veteran who has uh, just returned from Washington, and I'd like to transfer my, my membership in the American Legion from the Washington Post to the uh, Sonora Post. And uh, they were glad to, to uh, accept him into the organization, and he used this opportunity to make a lot of friends in the Sonora area. In 1925, Archie had a very, a very close call. He, uh, he, was, he was in Tuolumne City, and he, um, he was uh, purchasing supplies in Bigelow's store. And uh, when he went into Bigelow's, he, he didn't know it at the time, but there was a constable in there. His name was William Rodifer, and he was the Tuolumne constable. He sees this guy come in wearing a Luger on one side and a hatchet on the other side and um, uh, uh, approached him and mentioned it to him. And, and uh, uh, after talking with him for a while, Rodifer was convinced that he had Monty Wolf. So he loaded him up into his car, which was probably a Model T at the time, 
and drove him into Sonora uh, and uh, explained to the sheriff that he had this guy named, that he thought was Monty Wolf. And uh, uh, Monty Wolf was able to prove or to produce identification that his name wasn't Monty Wolf, it was in fact Archie Wright. And so they gave him his Luger back, they said sorry, and they let him go. Christmas of that year, Archie Wright um, leaves Tuolumne, and uh, uh, he had he had decided that he could make a lot more money trapping pine marten, um, you know, winter weasels, uh, foxes, and uh, you know other fur-bearing animals. Um, remember, we're not in the depression yet, but we're in the years approaching the. Depression. The depression when the fur trade in North America was at its peak. Everybody went furs. And um, you you could during those years get anything from five to fifty dollars for a pine marten fur, uh, depending on how it was prepared and, and where you sold it. Um, Archie Archie left Tuolumne on Christmas. He he uh, traveled up the Clavey River again, and he, he uh, had left note with uh, his friends in the American Legion that he was going on a trapping run uh, near the Quilty Mill, which isn't there anymore, but it, it was a, uh, you know, uh, one, of, one of a stamp mill for stamping uh, gold ore that had been there from the earlier century. Um, he, uh, he left in, on Christmas, and by April of that year, his friends started, started becoming concerned. It took them that long to become concerned, but by April, Archie Wright, their friend Archie Wright, not Monty Wolf, Archie Wright, um, they, they uh, conducted a search for him, and they found evidence uh, in the uh, uh, cattleman's cabin at the Rosasco Range, which um, is up sort of along the Clavy and maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit south of the Clavy River. They found evidence that Archie Wright had been there, and the evidence was a large pile of deer hides. Um, and they were that that was Archie Wright. So um, Archie Wright is gone now. He he uh, he has disappeared into the Sierras, and uh, nobody knows where he's at. But people feel, um, as as uh, the newspapers stated, that uh, uh, he did what all smart trappers do, and that's as as the season as the winter progresses. You move, move further up to stay to stay within the snow in order to do your trapping. So uh, that's they, they were convinced that's what he did, and in fact that is what he did. But he did a lot more that year. This this is another reason why why we remember Monty Wolf to this day. Monty that year uh, went on what I call the trapping rage of 1926. And uh, there were a couple of articles uh, in different papers that basically said Monty Wolf is back. And during that winter, um, let's see here. During the course of the 1925-26 the winter, Monty Wolf operated out of at least six closed highland grazing camps. Um, and each of those, each of those locations was, when I measured it, equal to a 60-mile trap line in one winter. He uh, spent time in the Rosasco Range cabin, which I mentioned. Um, then he uh, 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 appears at the Coons camp in, in Gavin's Meadows, which is where Spice is today. Um, and what's interesting to note here is that you, you, 
you think that Spicer is a long way from the Sonora Pass, but it's really only about 10 miles from Cow Creek. Um, so the distance between the Rosasco cabin and the Gavitt's Meadow cabin was only about 10 miles as the crow flies. But I looked at the topos and it's like, like unbelievably difficult mountains to cross, I, I would believe, in the winter. Um, after he hit the uh, Coons Camp cabin in Gavitt's Meadows, he, uh, he, he uh, visited Doc Weirich's cabin in Stanislaus Meadows. He, Doc Weirich, uh, who, who is known by some people in this room, I know for a fact, um, uh, reported that his cabin had been broken into, but he decided not to press any charges. Uh, Monty Wolf also wintered in the Tower Camp in Stanislaus Meadows, and then he finished off his winter in the Coons Camp, or excuse me, in the uh, uh, Rolleri Camp at Mosquito Lakes, and then at the Tryon Camp at Island Lakes. So each one of these were progressively higher in elevation, but equally a 60 mile, a 60 mile run uh, uh, accented by half a dozen different cabins, uh, each with a special treat left by money after he, after he left. Okay, it's time for one of those rewinds that I told you about. Uh, we're going to rewind now from 1926 uh, to 1906 through 1909. Uh, these were the years when Monty's uh, or Archie's family had um, left for the Palouse. Um, he's a young 20-year-old guy living in California by himself, probably trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life. It was during those years that Archie met a lady named Goldie Faye Coolidge. And Goldie Coolidge uh, was the daughter of a, um, a pioneer farmer that lived down in the Modesto area. And like Monty's family, the Coolidges got to California by making several itinerant stops along the way. They came through, they, they farmed for a while in New Mexico and, and then came up here. The difference was though that, that the Wright family was very poor and the Coolidge family was very wealthy. Um, Goldie Fay was the, was the eldest of eight children and um, by 1909, Archie Wright is married to Goldie Fay Coolidge. Something nobody has ever heard before outside of this room. Um, I'm gonna fast forward again to 1927. Sorry about that. Um, the title of this slide is A Complaint is Finally Sworn. Um, until 1927, there were no complaints against Monty Wolf. Uh, oh, sorry. Is that better? Hello. Thanks. Um, in 1927, a complaint was lodged in Tuolumne County by a gentleman named Chauncey Alexander, who uh, in my book is uh, sort of a famous Money Wolf uh, uh, celebrity. Um, Chauncey had charged that Ed McGrath had stolen his rifle that he had left unattended. And uh, uh, just a little bit on Chauncey, his family was from the Groveland side, but he was a trapper at the time living in Tuolumne where Monty did. And um, they had been acquainted. They knew each other. Um, however, uh, uh, Chauncey really wanted that rifle back. He, he was not happy at all about losing his rifle. In September of 1927, uh, Monty Wolf, using the name Monty Wolf, was the most wanted man in Tuolumne County. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier, because I'm jumping all over the place here, is that I mentioned that that Monty was lying, that they thought Monty was lying low because there was a sheriff election coming up. 
The thing I failed to mention was that Sheriff Sweeney lost that election, and it was due at least in part to the fact that he couldn't bring this, this uh, uh, bandit in. And uh, a new man uh, became sheriff down in Sonora, and his name was John Henry Dambacher III. And the Dambachers are a pioneer Columbia family. They were of the first families to move into Columbia. They were very well known and, are, and continue to be very well known um, in, the, uh, in the Sonora area. Um, Jack Dombacher was highly respected by the community because he was, a, he was a guy that would protect the people of the community from outsiders and, um, and he drew the line at the law and people knew that that even if they were his good friend, that they'd still be held liable if they, if they broke the law. Um, during the, the uh, year of 1927, Dombacher and his people were, the, the majority of their focus was on prohibition, you know, illegal prohibition alcohol and gambling. That was a, that was a big problem uh, in the Sonora and Tuolumne County area. Uh, during during the uh, prohibition, okay. Um, a rumor had arisen that Monty Wolf was up on Ebbets Pass. The wanted Monty Wolf was up on Ebbets Pass, um, building a fireplace at the Alpine Lodge. Uh, which at the time that the Alpine Lodge was built in 1927, um, it was a, at, in those years it was a three-story lodge, and Monty Wolf was hired to build the fireplace, which I just went and touched this morning and got all excited. It was pretty neat. <laughs> Monty Wolf's fireplace. It's amazing. Some of some of the it's all made out of local granite, and some of the blocks are are this long, this deep, and this high. They have to weigh 300 pounds. I mean, I'm sure he didn't lift them up, but, but uh, you know, uh, he found a way to do it. So, acting on a tip, actually a tip from B.R. Gianelli, the man that built the, uh, the uh, Alpine Lodge, uh, Sheriff Dombacher hopped in his Model T, and he drove up to Angel's Camp, where he met uh, Sheriff Zwingi from Calaveras, or Zwingi, I think, or my Swing, swing. Um, he met uh, Sheriff Swing and told him that he was going up to Alpine County to make an arrest and that he had some business that night in Sonora and wondered if they could hold his prisoner for him for uh, that night. And he, he, was, he was held in the, the small jail in Angel's Camp, not the traditional jail that you find over in San Andreas. They had a little town jail there. Um, the next morning, um, or excuse me, that afternoon, Sheriff uh, Dombacher drove his tea up the dirt, Big Trees Road, which we know now as Highway 4, um, and uh, probably took him six hours to get up there from Sonora. Uh, when he arrived, he met with the Alpine County Sheriff, whose name was Brown, and I will remember his first name in a while. Um, anyway, Sheriff Brown and his deputies, along with Sheriff Don Bacher, surprised Monty while he was laying granite at the fireplace um, and arrested him without incident and drove him back down to, to uh, 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 Angels where he spent that night. The next morning, Sheriff Dombacher sent a cab from Sonora with two armed officers to pick him up and bring him back to Sonora. So, uh, Monty Wolf's busted. But before we go on, we're going to rewind to 1909. Uh, th this time we're going to talk about Monty's first brush with the law. Um, after marrying Goldie Fay, 
Archie was arrested and convicted for second degree burglary in Stanislaus County. Um, I made every attempt in the world to get the records of that trial, and as it turns out, all of the microfilm uh, down in Modesto is all mixed up in a box, and it would take it would take a lot of hours and time for them to find them. They were able to find some of it, and and I got that, but but the specifics of why he was arrested um, are still unclear. However, there are two things that are clear. Um, Number one, uh, he, he was convicted for second degree burglary, which um, the lawyers in the group can probably correct me, but I, I believe second degree burglary is um, a burglary that it happens during the daytime when nobody's home. So uh, it becomes a more serious crime, obviously, when, when somebody is there. There was an old one strike law in those days that basically um, uh, uh, meant that Archie was going to spend time behind bars. He appeared in court uh, on November 11th, 1909. He appeared in court without counsel. He pled guilty as charged and was sentenced to 18 months in Folsom Prison in Granite. California. I love it. They call it Folsom now, but they, they called it Granite for a while, and then they changed the name to Repressa. Interesting. Anyway. I know you can't see this, but maybe you've seen it before. This is Archie Wright's mugshot taken the day that he was uh, uh, checked in to his hotel in the big house. Uh, in Sacramento with Folsom. And he was uh, 23 years old at this time. Handsome young man. Um, with some distinctive moles on his face and uh, some distinctive other markings that uh, allowed us to compare this photo to uh, newer photos that were taken in the more recent past. Okay, jumping forward again. We know Mar Archie now has been busted. Um, meanwhile, in 1927, up in Sonora, um, the attorneys started doing some positioning. Um, they, well, let me see this first. Um, during the pre preliminary examination, which is, you know, the, the very first part of, of the trial before they decide how they're going to move forward with the trial, um, it was disclosed that, or let me put it this way, the, the judge reduced the charges from felony to misdemeanor because, as they put it, uh, because of the manner in which uh, Chauncey Alexander's gun had been taken. So I still don't know what that means. There's some more research there, but, but uh, most probably Chauncey left his gun sitting on his front porch or around somewhere, and Archie saw it and, and needed it. Okay. Um, so, uh, the lawyers, knowing that they had the notorious Monty Wolf in custody, um, and knowing that their charges had just been reduced from felony to misdemeanor, um, the, the uh, district attorney, uh, Clarence Grayson, in Sonora, and Sheriff Dombacher, um, were a little concerned that they weren't going to be able to put this terrible bandit behind bars uh, because now they only had him on, on a misdemeanor. Um, and so they, they felt that it was time for them to start getting creative. Uh, after the preliminary questioning, Grayson and Dombacher realized that they had a suspect with a whole bunch of names, a whole bunch of aliases some of which we've discussed already. Um, Dombacher wrote a letter to the California State um, Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation um, in Sacramento, California. Um, I talked to Dombach Dombacher's son, who remembers some of this, and he said his father just hated having to go to Sacramento to get help. But he wrote a letter, he sent 
He sent uh, this man's fingerprints and the aliases that they knew, not including the name Archie Wright, to uh, Sacramento. And um, uh, there, uh, there, the uh, State Department of, of uh, Criminal Identification began the process of trying to identify just who this Monty Wolf guy was. Um, let me see here. The CSB, CI, and I, as I like to call it, the California State Bureau of Criminal Investigation and Identification. Um, uh, the, the assignment for identifying uh, this man that was in jail up in Sonora was given to a man named C.S. Morrill, Sherwood Morrill. Morrill was able to match fingerprints to the Folsom to, to Folsom inmate, number 744, and was able to attach the name Archie Wright to the long list of aliases. So this was, in fact, the time when Archie Wright was exposed. He, uh, people now knew that Archie Wright and Monty Wolf and Ed McGrath and Archie Arlington and a couple of others were, in fact, the same person. So, uh, uh, Sherwood Morrill writes a letter back to Don Bacher, and I have a copy of the letter, it's really neat. Um, and he basically says, I, I, you know, I've got your number one man, this is who he is, um, and uh, the prosecution, as you might imagine, was a stab, because uh, now they had um, an, an ex-convict that they might be able to build a case around, that they might be able to turn back into a felony and put him away. Um, they had two witnesses that had earlier seen Archie Wright, Monty Wolf, uh, wearing a handgun. We know that he wore a Luger into Bigelow's store. Um, well, the, the uh, uh, constable that had him and let him go, William Rodefer, he raised his hand and said, hey, I've witnessed this ex-convict wearing a, wearing a weapon that could be concealed on his person. And that's a felony. Um, and so uh, they had a witness now for a felony charge. Well, poor old Chauncey is sitting back there saying, what about my gun? You know, you're changing the case. We're not gonna get my gun back. And um, what they did is they talked Chauncey into being a second witness because Chauncey commented that he had seen him once wearing a gun. So now he has two counts of felony, uh, former felon carrying a weapon that can be concealed. And what he was wearing was a Luger. It was exposed on the outside. You could, they could tell it was a Luger by just looking at the, the handle on the gun. So it wasn't hidden, um, but, but uh, it was enough to uh, get uh, Archie in a lot of trouble. So, the case finally goes to trial on December 1st, 1927, after several delays. Uh, testimony from Alexander and Rodefer were both heard. Uh, they basically explained uh, uh, when they saw Monty Wolf, what they saw him carrying, and uh, 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 presented all of that to the, jerk, to the Sonora jury. Then uh, the attorneys, uh, Monty Wolf's attorney was a man named Bush from Oakdale, and uh, district attorney uh, for the people was Grayson. Um, they made their arguments after the, uh, after Rodefer and Alexander had made theirs. Um, at four o'clock on that afternoon, the jury went into deliberation, and 30 minutes later, they came back with um, a decision, and the decision was, and I wish I could read it to you because it's so neat, but um, by 4.30 the decision was made that the defendant was not guilty on both counts, um, and uh, uh, that was read to the court. I have a copy of, of that actual statement from the jury. All of this is in the archives. 
Cosby. You can, you can go to the uh, archive in Sonora and read the testimony of these people during the trial. Really interesting. Really interesting. So, now we have a guy who, who, um, who had problems in 1921, uh, chased the sheriff off with a gun, uh, was later arrested, uh, had the charges changed on him. They never pursued the original charges of chasing uh, the constable and, um, and, and uh, Farmer Hadley off with the gun. They never prosecuted him on that because they both died while he, Archie was in, prison, or in jail in Sonora waiting for trial. It was an odd thing, but both of them passed away during that period. And they were the only witnesses. So all they really had, um, you know, for him were, were, were the, uh, carrying the weapon charges, and he was he was acquitted for that. Um, so uh, after the 1927 trial, he's a free man. Um, he he knows now that that he can name, he can use the name Monty Wolf. If he's in the store or if he's out on the street, he can tell people his name is Monty Wolf. He can walk freely and not worry about any harassment from the law. And um, that, that uh, created a new man. Because instead of a, a man that's hiding, he's now a man that's out in the public. And, and actually, this was the Monty Wolf that we all learned enjoy and, and uh, hear stories about that live back down here in the canyon. The, the Monty Wolf that we know that lived on the McCollamy um, was a free man. He was not hiding from the law. He was not in that canyon because he was trying to escape the law. He was in that canyon because he wanted to be alone. Um, Monty left Tuolumne County forever, although we do know that he Went back over there a couple of, slipped over the border up here actually and uh, did a couple things up there uh, and uh, um, he he uh, came back here to Alpine County where he had started as a cowboy in 1916 to uh, to live the rest of his life well a free man needs a home right so uh, Monty Wolf, uh, because he had been working uh, up in the Tryon camp near Highland Lakes, he was familiar with that, that part of the mountains and he was familiar with the, uh, uh, the canyon of, of the North Fork of the McCallany. So um, sometime after he got, after he left Sonora, probably right after, he built his upper cabin uh, about five miles down the McCallany River from where the uh, McCallamy crosses under uh, Highway 4 up at Hermit Valley. Um, some of you may have, have been to that cabin. I, I know I was there as a, as a young man and actually uh, slept inside of it. Uh, the upper cabin was, at, as you may know, it was all built with 18-inch diameter logs. Monty did it by himself. Um, he probably built, built ramps and used TVs to uh, pull the logs up, and uh, when he finished, he he coated the entire exterior of the cabin with uh, cedar shakes that he had cut himself. He was a real shingle cutter. I mean, you see that in his lower cabin too, actually. Um, and the fact that his new cabin was on government land uh, really didn't bother him very much. He, he, uh, he knew that nobody would bother him. Nice picture of Monty Wolf standing up in his upper cabin. I know you can't see it, but here it is. I really wish these slides worked. Okay, here we go again. Rewind to 1912. Archie and Goldie Wright, Archie and Goldie Fay raise a family. Archie's released from Folsom three months early uh, in uh, 1911. Probably got out on good behavior. I assume. You know, there, there may be other reasons, but he was released three months early. And um, he returned to Goldie Fay, who waited for him um, 
during those years when he was in prison. And um, between, after he got out of prison, uh, which was in 1912, uh, him, and, him and Goldie started building a family and they had one baby every year for the next four years. Archie's first child was named Goldie Ina Wright. Goldie was mom's name, Ina was grandma's name. His second son was Edwin Wright. That's Monty's middle name, Edwin. Third son was Glenn Wright. And the fourth son was Norman Wright. Around 1916, something happened in their marriage. Don't know what it was, we'll probably never find out, but we know that Monty and Goldie Fay split that year. Um, Goldie Fay married another man and had a child by him in 1919. So she raised Archie's four boys plus the son of her new husband. And, um, and she changed their names from Wright to Mills. And this was when Archie, excuse me, this was when Archie retreated to the mountains to spend the rest of his life living a, a, the lonely life of a, of a uh, recluse. Nice photo of Archie's kids that you can't see. Sorry. Okay. I am writing a book, by the way. And the photo will be in there, and it will be nice and clear. Okay, fast forward to 1932. 1932 was an important year for Monty Wolf. He had built his upper cabin, um, and uh, he was at that cabin uh, early in the summer of 32, burning out a, a rattlesnake nest that was near his cabin. He had this thing about rattlesnakes being too close to his house, which I guess I would too. And uh, uh, so he stuffed a bunch of brush under the rock and lit it on fire. And it just so happened that a young family, a, a man, woman, and 11-year-old child were fishing in the colony and saw the smoke. So they hiked up the hill and they see this, they see this guy uh, uh, with a stick poking this fire. And they said, hey, and Monty Wolf, he scared the hell out of Monty Wolf. And he uh, grabbed his gun and uh, told him to hold on right there, and um, uh, things, got, things got a little better. They, uh, when Monty saw that, that they were just there fishing and, and that there was a woman and a young child, he put the, book, uh, the, the gun down and um, uh, really kind of opened up to them, was very friendly. Um, that family were the Linfords of Oakland, California. And the Linfords became steadfast friends of Monty Wolf from 1932 until he disappeared in 1940. Uh, in fact, the, the mother of the 11-year-old child uh, wrote a book about Monty Wolf that some of you may have read. It is, it, there have been a couple of books, but that particular book is very authoritative when it comes to understanding the personality of the man because you can't get personality from a census record, but, but you can from, from people that, that knew him. And um, over the years, uh, uh, the Linfords would, Monty Wolf would, every April or May, send them a letter telling them about the water and when to come up to fish. Um, they would come up on the first trip of the year, collect all of his, all of his pelts that he had uh, uh, managed to trap during the winter and they would take them down to San Francisco and sell them to a furrier and so over the years their their relationship almost turned into a partnership in in uh, 1934 the summer of 1934 uh, uh, Monty Wolf was uh, concerned because that was when they were starting to pave the Big Trees Road out here. And uh, he knew that a paved road would bring more people into the canyon. Um, he wanted to be alone. And uh, uh, so he started at that time looking into 
building another cabin much further downstream in the uh, in the uh, North Fork Canyon. Um, and uh, he also had the, the upper cabin, as you may know, is at a pretty high elevation. And in the wintertime, it, it pretty much was covered every year. So while it worked well as a place for him to, to um, skin animals and, and all of that, it was, a very, it was only about uh, 10 or 11 in, uh, feet square. And uh, um, it, it, winters were, were too difficult. So he built another cabin uh, further down the McCallamy, a cabin that still stands to this day in the McCallamy Wilderness. Um, the cabin was 14 by 20 feet. It had three rooms, a uh, log cabin. This time he put the shingles on the inside as opposed to the outside. Don't know why. Um, and uh, used a big 24-inch log as the uh, kind of the uh, ledger to hold the roof up when there was heavy snow. Um, at his lower cabin, he also planted a very large garden um, that kept him in fruit and vegetables during the spring and summer, and then uh, uh, I know he, 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 from something that the Linfords wrote, that he grew 400 pounds of tomatoes, or, or excuse me, potatoes, um, and, uh, and he, he uh, dug a pit, lined it with oak leaves, put the potatoes in there, covered them up, and they were, you know, good for the winter. And he'd go out there every once in a while and dig a couple of them out. So he, um, like his father, the farmer, uh, Monty Wolf uh, uh, was able to, um, uh, uh, he, he's a man that, that uh, was a subsistence liver and, you know, he either had to eat trout or hunt for animals or come up with canned food somehow. Um, and we know how he did that. Um, and uh, the vegetable garden was like the, the next natural step for a guy that, that uh, really wanted to do it on his own. There's a wonderful picture over here of Monty's lower cabin. And that cabin looks just like that to this day. Um, 1932 to 1940. Um, if you do the math, uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1936, Monty Wolf was 50. So this was he was in his late 40s, early 50s during the 1930s, and he kind of during that time he was he was really no longer breaking into people's cabins. Um, he he was trapping, setting his trap lines between his two cabins as opposed to between other people's cabins. And um, he uh, started hanging out in Tamarack and uh, uh, selling his services as a fishing guide during the spring and summer. And uh, during the winter, he would guide hunters. And because of his reputation during the two decades before of being a, you know, a, a wanted bandit and a, you know, a super mountain man. He was sought out for his services, for his guiding services. And uh, I know uh, Mr. Shimke told me that Monty's, uh, Monty's uh, a typical statement was $3 a day and guaranteed fish. So if you, if you hired Monty, he would carry all your gear and he would promise that, that you would uh, bring fish home. Um, during that period, Monty Wolf really basked in, um, in his past. And, and people knew him. He was always surrounded by people, excuse me, he was always surrounded by people who wanted to talk to him. Um, I know there's a story that Mr. Shimke told me uh, about uh, Monty Wolf uh, being up at, up at Tamarack, waiting outside the store, and a, a busload of women from, from the All Girls Mills College in uh, uh, Oakland arrives at Tamarack and the girls start getting off the bus and he was charging five cents a piece for his autograph. So they, they, they all knew who Money Wolf was down there. In 
1935, uh, uh, Monty was 49 years old, and he was guiding um, a group of brothers named the Andersons. Are there any relation, relatives of the Andersons here? Have to ask first. Um, <laughs> he was guiding the Andersons into Wheeler Lake. And um, Wheeler Lake has, there's a couple ways you can get in there. One is you can go up over the top of the hill, which has snow on it most of the year. And the other one is you can go a little bit further down uh, Highway 4 and take a little bit longer hike that's not nearly as mountainous. Well, he had his clients, uh, they wanted to go to Wheeler Lake, and they chose to take the direct route over the top. So when, when they reached the top, there was a, a still snow up there. There was a, the scree slope um, below the mountain was covered with snow. And uh, he sat down on the snow and he told the Anderson brothers to pay attention because this is the way you do it. And uh, Monty started sliding down that hill. He sailed off over a ledge landed on the ground, fractured his left leg in two places. He wanted his three dollars pretty bad, so he told the Anderson boys to go right over to that lake, that's Wheeler Lake, you guys fish, I'll be fine. So here's a guy with his leg broken in two places, laying on the trail. The poor guy was there for four hours before one of the guides from Alpine Lake found him and was able to uh, bring some additional help in and they, uh, they carried him out on a stretcher that day. And uh, he spent uh, a, a little bit of time uh, living in one of the tent cabins up near Tamarack, which I'm sure is long gone now. And then, uh, well, excuse me, he went down to San Andreas to the hospital, got his leg fixed, stayed down there for a while, ate, you know, this guy who's used to eating uh, uh, biscuits made out of bear fat didn't, didn't uh, do well in the hospital. So when he was released, he came up. Uh, a friend of, of the uh, Linfords had a cabin over in Santa Cruz, and they offered that to him for his recuperation because there was no way he could get back down to his lower cabin. So um, he spent a couple of weeks there, couldn't stand it, wrote a note saying, I got to get back to my Sierras, as he called them. And uh, he cleaned the cabin up, filled the wood bin with, with wood, uh, uh, kind of a Monty Wolf thing. This time he was doing it for a personal friend. And um, he hitchhiked back up here to the mountains um, and uh, decided as fall, was, as fall was approaching that he still really wasn't ready to make the walk down into the canyon. So um, he... Uh, had known um, Jack and Doreen Connell. Is that right? And Doreen Connell. He, he uh, knew Jack and Doreen Connell at Camp Connell, and um, they fixed him up with a small cabin there. And he spent uh, from Thanksgiving until the middle of January there, including Christmas. And during that, that, that was the first year that the Connells were keeping Camp Connell open in the wintertime. Before that, it was a you know a summer resort, and uh, um, there there are um, stories about Monty Wolf chasing the Camp Connell cook around the restaurant and freaking out all the customers, and it was really just a little thing that the two of them had to uh, to uh, impress people, you know, with this wild mountain man. And then uh, there there's another story about uh, uh, while Monty was at Camp Connell. Um, he, he's getting better, and he uh, took a job, um, not at Camp Connell, but there, you guys can probably tell me, Don and Tom, uh, uh, down by Dorrington, there used to be a rope tow or something down there. Um, he, he took a job down there um, uh, teaching people how to ski. And uh, from what I've heard, he wasn't a very good skier, but uh, nonetheless, he, he uh, uh, taught people how to ski. And there were several stories about uh, in the uh, Camp Connell bar uh, during that period where Monty put skis on, climbed up on top of the bar with his poles, and he's like showing people how to ski. And uh, you know, uh, as, as they put it, uh, he showed people how to ski, including how to fall off a bar. So. <laughs>
by, um, by January, he decided it was time to go back down into the canyon. You guys know what it's like around here in January. Um, he decided not to go down Grouse Valley. He decided not to go to Hermit Valley and go down. Instead, he decided to go that way, which is, which is over some pretty, uh, pretty nasty terrain. He climbed down into uh, Underwood Valley, which some of you may be aware of. And then um, below Underwood Valley is almost a straight granite cliff down to the river. He slid, de slid down there um, and uh, made it to his cabin. Um, evidently, he, he later complained that he, the snow was so deep that uh, he had to kind of trudge his own trail through four foot deep snow to get down there. Yeah, it was amazing. Okay, that's it for the story of Money Wolf, but there is more. If I can find it. This looks familiar. I'm going to skip it. Um, while I was doing this research about Monty Wolf, um, I was just blown away by the number of really strange coincidental things that I found out while, while, I, was, while I was looking into Monty's past. Um, so this, this is called Odd Coincidence Number One. Um, are there any Shimkeys in the audience today? Can I see hands? Or... Got some Shimkeys over there? Okay, well... That the year that Archie was born in the Dakota Territory, a German immigrant entered Mercer County, that's Monty's County, from Odessa. His name was Daniel Schimke. He later became a part of Mercer County history in the Dakota Territories. Um, Mr. Schimke, where does your family come from? Before or after Russia? Yeah. The Shimkeys, who later became close friends of Monty Wolf um, and, and uh, carriers of, of, of the story of Monty Wolf, the legends of Monty Wolf, had actually, their ancestors touched each other. You know, there were, there were so few people in Mercer County um, that the chances that the Shimkeys knew the rights is probably very high. There weren't, there, I mentioned that there were a couple hundred people, but there were only 30 families. So in, in a county with 30 families, you know, everybody knows everybody. So um, there's a very good chance that the Shimkeys and the, the, the rights were associated when Archie was a baby. Odd coincidence number two. Archie's wife, Faye Coolidge, her grandfather was the brother of Calvin Coolidge's grandfather. That means that Archie was the second cousin of the 30th president of the United States <laughs> by marriage. <laughs> Pretty weird, huh? It's true. The Coolidge's told me. And then I went on to Ancestry and dug and dug and dug and dug. I found the connection. God, I wish I could show you this on the projector. Odd coincidence number three. Monty Wolf's 1918 draft card. Name, Monty Delmar Wolf. Uh, let's see, residence, Tuolumne City. Age 36. I'm sorry, I don't do this a lot. Um, birth date, April 20th. Um, place of birth, Canada via Great Britain. <laughs> Occupation, prospector. Employer, Charles Tryon, Alpine, California. Father's name, Thomas. Thomas Wolfe. <laughs> and he 
he's from, he's from Nelson, British Columbia. Um, well, I was, because this came from 1918, and it was my belief that in 1918, Monty Wolf was mainly hanging out down there at Groveland. This was a real surprise to see that he was on I lied, that's not really the end. <laughs> there are actually two more things here. Um, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. Uh, I mentioned that Archie Wright had a brother and a sister. They both married and had kids. And those kids had kids. And I talked to them all. Archie, or Alma, Archie's sister, had a daughter named Nina. And uh, Nina would be Archie's niece. And Nina's 97 years old today. And when I told her about Archie Wright, she cracked up. She thought that was the funniest thing she ever did. Um, she was the source of a lot of my information about traveling westward in a wagon. And she told me about the, the oxen and the mules traveling at different speeds. And um, it, it's just a, just a pleasure to speak with her. Um, Archie's brother, Arthur, also had two kids. And their kin are also living, and, and they're a growing family of rights up in the northeastern part of, northeastern for you guys, uh, part of Oregon in a town called Enterprise, which is a really beautiful place. And uh, they're all kind of blown away by this story as well. Okay, baby, here it comes. Archie had four children, Goldie Ina, Edwin, Glenn, and Norman. They've all deceased in the recent past, which is sad because they would have been a college of knowledge in this research. Glenn did have a son, um, Archie's grandson, and uh, unfortunately I haven't found him, uh, it, it, but we know that he's living somewhere on the East Coast. Norman had a daughter named Norma, and she had a daughter named Alexis. And this is them. These are, these are Archie's granddaughters, Monty Wolf's granddaughters, alive today. And they're here with us. And I'd like, I'd like both of you Equinoas to walk through that curtain over there and come up onto this stage and let people embrace you. They really don't want to do this. Norma, son of Norman, granddaughter of Monty Wolf. And this is Alexis, Norman, uh, Norma's daughter, and she's the great-granddaughter of Monty Wolf. They both live in any of my That's it, folks. Um, if uh, they, they live today, there's, there is another part to this. I need to say this. Um, after Archie and Goldie split up, Goldie and the kids moved to Stockton. And the kids were all born and raised in Stockton. They went to Stockton High School. Um, and uh, never knew, never knew about, about Daddy. Um, but their, their granddaughters know, and they're back here today where their grandfather and great-grandfather left us 70 years ago this year. Um, okay, in closing, I'd like to thank a couple of people here, um, and I'd, I'd, I would like them to step forward uh, to receive a little uh, token from me. Um, Art Shimke, are you in the audience by any chance? I know you are. I'm, I'm sure most of you know 
Mr. Shinke, but if you don't, this man was a personal friend of Monty Wolf's for several years. Um, he is the the uh, have, is a vast repository of the information that lets you understand the person. The things that you can't get in a census, you get from art. In uh, April of uh, 42, we, uh, we just finished taking the snow surveys, and we was at Lake Alpine, and um, we was getting ready to leave. And I looked up the window, and I see this black cocker spaniel dog looking down at me, and I says, uh oh, here comes Monty. Sure enough, there he came, and he spent three days with me. I fattened him up a little bit. <laughs> he was pretty hungry. And when he left, he didn't have snowshoes, he didn't have skis, he was chest deep in the snow, waddling through. And I said, man, you must be crazy. And I went with him to the top of uh, the ridge, and he went down the, um, um, uh, not, not Wheeler Ridge, but, uh, uh, oh, the other one, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, that's the way he went, took him right down to uh, Camp Irene, to where his cabin was. And that was the end of it. He never surfaced again, ever. And after the war, Sheriff Brown came over and visited me. And he wanted to know if we had a kind of an argument or something. And I said, no way. He left with his best of friends. In fact, he, he spent three days with me, and uh, he was, you know, in good shape. But the way he packed heavy loads, it wouldn't surprise me that he had a heart attack. And he's probably down in that brush somewhere. One of these days, somebody will find an old belt buckle or something, and when you do, you'll find the bones of that little black cocker spaniel right there, too. That <laughs> dog never left him. But anyway, uh, uh, like I say, uh, all, all I know, he never alluded to me that he ever was married or that he even had a brother or a sister or anything. He just, he was more interested in but he could get to eat. The Lindfords that knew him so well knew him as Edward Yeah. But anyway, he never, he never told me anything about any other name except money. You know, that was his, his money. <laughs> but anyway, he was, he would trap a lot, but he was very Pacific. He didn't want anybody trapping in his area. And Jack Bland from Groveland, he was a very good trapper too, trying Martin. And he got a cabin at High, uh, Mosquito Lake. And he was trapping there. And Bonnie came down. And he kept telling me he's going to kill him. He says, I'm going to kill him. And he says, You should help me. He says, He's in your territory too. And I says, Bonnie, he can trap any place he wants. I don't give a dime. <laughs> Monty didn't like that one bit, because I wasn't getting mad at him like he was, you know. But anyway, he disappeared, and I don't know what happened. No one knows. They didn't find no bodies, nothing. And uh, I myself think he died on his own, because talk about heavy loads. Me and the Lombardis were uh, hunting down at Grouse Canyon. And it was towards evening time, we were sitting around the campfire drinking coffee, and pretty good, here comes Monty up to McCauley. He had a big pack on So he stood there and talked to him around, and Ozzy says, well, take your pack off and have some coffee. Sit down. We took it off that pack, and so, and Ozzy, and he says, what the hell are you ski stealing now, Monty? <laughs> And he had a keg of nails that he stole down at Salt Springs. He was carrying up, he was, going, he was building a cabin at Cedar Camp just around the